WPKN 89.5 FM. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Pierre, your neighborhood naturopathic doctor and public health advocate, bringing you the best of what integrative medicine has to offer. We broadcast for Bridgeport, Connecticut on the fourth Saturday of every month from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Here on Seeking Wellness, we discuss various health topics while clarifying some misconceptions about naturopathic medicine and providing education from a clinical, holistic perspective. If you're a long-time listener, welcome back. If you're new to the party, come on in, take off your shoes, and get comfortable. If you've missed any of our past shows, please log on to our website, wpkn.org, to explore our archives and podcasts. Welcome, everyone, to another Seeking Wellness show. Today, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room, COVID-19. So I wanted to touch upon what we know so far. And um, in efforts to flatten the curve, um, we're actually not broadcasting from the studio today. So if anyone is concerned about that, (laughs) there you can rest your mind at ease that we are taking all the precautions necessary. The information I've compiled for you today is from various sources, including the CDC, the World Health Organization, Up to Date, and naturopathic doctors, Dr. David Brady, Dr. Diodamo, and Dr. Todd Lapine, who held an amazing informational session earlier this week that I was privy to. Today, I will not be discussing any remedies, cures, or anything like that, because I don't want anything that I say to be misconstrued as treatment during this current COVID-19 pandemic. I also don't want to add to the hysteria, especially since many of the supplements commonly used by naturopathic doctors are out of stock or back-ordered due to people grasping at straws for the treatment. Um, It can also be dangerous to try to discuss supplements or anything that could be um, used in conjunction with certain medications, um, especially if they're unsupervised due to potential herb and drug interactions. I know a lot of the listeners probably take supplements, and overall it may seem harmless, but I really want to stress that anyone interested in taking any herbs with their current medication should be supervised by a physician who's trained in pharmaceutical and herb interaction, i.e. a naturopathic doctor. And this is no slight to any medical doctor friends who I respect immensely. Um, Many of them are on the front lines right at this moment and risking their lives. Um, And I myself had the choice to move my medical practice to a telehealth format. If you're also interested in that, that is one of the decisions I made, um, as I know so many other people have had to make decisions about their workplaces. And I just want to make it clear that it is important to know when herbs and supplements are uh, appropriate and when they're not. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to contact me or any other naturopathic doctor if you are concerned. Let's just be safe. Um, If you want to hear anything that I've discussed previously during cold and flu season, I have a previous show from 2018. Um, Because while we're not necessarily thinking about it right now, it's still important to take preventative efforts in general because there's still other flu viruses going on. Um, People are still getting sick in other ways. So, It's just best for us to just take care of ourselves in this particular time. And I will keep stressing the fact that if you can, please, please, please stay home. Stay home because there's so many people working on the front lines trying to protect you. Um, And I know not everyone has that luxury. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about people who do have the possibility to stay at home. People like me who had to make the decision for my personal practice to move to a telehealth format as a lot of small medical practices can do right now and are doing it. You've probably already experienced that with your physician. So in the show today, I'm going to be discussing the science behind the virus, um, the epidemiology, how it's spreading, the testing behind it, and what's currently being investigated for treatment. Um, I know a lot of people probably heard some of the treatments on the news, I think a lot of us have been glued to the news, um, whether through social media, um, trying to get answers and get some information about the virus. And right now, a lot of our information is coming from China and um, what we're trying to do here in the state. And I personally believe, as I've said, stated before, that I believe that integrative medicine is the best response to various health conditions, including this one. 
um, what's been seen to be helping in China involves both natural and pharmaceutical. And, you know, I think that's the best way to move forward. Um, and I'm happy to see them employing all aspects of medicine at the current moment. Um, I hope, I really truly hope that this current pandemic um, really encourages the federal government and American citizens to take on an integrative approach moving forward. And this is not just something to, you know, promote myself. This is honestly what I believe. And I think it's time, as we've seen um, over and over again, you know, this whole situation has demonstrated that we have to do a lot more as far as preventative efforts, and that's the purpose of public health. And that's the lens I'm speaking from. Um, because prior to becoming a naturopathic physician, I worked in public health for many, many years. So I think right now we can all see that prevention is important, especially in the cases of chronic disease that, you know, the United States suffers from um, so severely, which is affecting how patients are responding to this virus. So let's begin with a little background. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm going into the background and how the virus kind of moves is maybe with having a better understanding of the virus, um, that may help certain people. It may not. Um, the information that I'm sharing is not meant to focus on um, death and destruction and, and, you know, to scare people. It really is to keep people informed. There are still people out there who, who believe that this is a hoax. There are still people out there who think that um, this is, you know, just some sort of conspiracy um, that is being used to scare people, and, and that's not the case. This is real. Um, it's real and it's affecting people, and people are dying. And I hope that in my little show <laughs> that people, you know, get the information that they need and really are aware of, of how important this is. So I didn't want to miss out on this opportunity to share the information that I have been privy to and I've compiled just to spread the information. So the data is constantly changing. So the data that I'm speaking about today on March 28th um, is going to be different than what it may be even a month from now. Every week we're seeing new cases. Every week there are more and more studies and research and we're getting more information out of other countries about how to move forward. So anything that I speak of today could be different tomorrow. COVID-19 is a newly identified, which is why they call it a novel, viral respiratory disease caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. So you may hear it being called SARS, uh, 2 sars cov v 2 virus. This virus is responsible for a large pneumonia outbreak in the Hubei province of China, and this resulted in the exportation of cases globally. Coronaviruses are not new. Um, I've heard people talk, and they were like, oh, you know, this is a conspiracy. The coronaviruses have been around. Yes, they have, but this particular one is new. On March 11th of 2020, the World Health Organization, also known as WHO, declared the global outbreak of COVID-19 a pandemic. And this just means when a disease has a global spread. And this was due to the virus um, being on more than six continents, exceeding 120,000 infected persons worldwide. So this was as of March 11th. And the public health measures continue to be implemented and executed in hopes of viral containment. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology and, and how the cases are being reported globally. So as of this morning, globally, more than 400,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported, with 80,000 reported from China. Unfortunately for us, the U.S. now leads the number of cases with 100,000 cases and a national death toll of 1,500, according to the New York Times. We have now surpassed Italy and China. In Connecticut, where we are broadcasting from, there are currently 1,291 cases. In New York, our neighbor, my home state, there are 45,000 cases in all New York City boroughs, and also including Long Island and Westchester, with 510 deaths. And Jersey is reporting currently 9,000 cases. So um, I know 
we call ourselves the tri-state area. So whatever happens in New York is going to affect the bordering states as well. So right now, when we first when we first started hearing about these um, coronavirus cases, they were mostly being heard about from the West Coast, and potentially people are thinking it started with travel coming to the United States, but it's no longer a travel situation, um, and it's not quite clear um, how these cases are spreading. We just know person to person. The first cases were initially associated with a seafood market in China that sold live animals, and then afterwards it spread from person to person. Currently, it is believed that transmission is through respiratory droplets. So if you cough or sneeze or contact your mucous membranes in your eyes, nose, or mouth, you could be potentially spreading these droplets. The droplets do not travel more than six feet. This is why the recommendation of physical distancing is six feet apart. So there's these um, these recommendations that we're making and um, that we hear being made um, from the CDC are because of research that we're seeing from the virus. The viral RNA has been detected in blood and stool samples thus far, and it may be useful in the future to test stool samples to test the immunity of certain patients. A question that's commonly asked is how long are individuals infectious? Unfortunately, it's unclear at the moment how long a person is considered infectious. Transmission may be more likely in the early onset based on how high the viral RNA is. There's also a very wide range in viral shedding, and this is from 10 to 20 days. For instance, some people who are more sick tested positive longer, and this is why isolation is generally recommended for 14 days especially vulnerable populations or nursing homes and prisons, basically any place where people are congregating. This is why students were sent home from colleges and dorms, um, because it, the rate of infection is, is so easily spread. And this is also why I personally believe New York is struggling so much because of the dense population. As far as immunity, there are antibodies that are induced by those who are affected. In some studies, they saw that the rhesus macaque, which is a type of simian, um, so like a monkey type of species, did not develop reinfection following recovery and rechallenge. So what that means is as of right now, it appears that if you are infected and you recover, um, if you are reinfected, you should not express symptoms again. So what are these symptoms? The symptoms, expressions, and severity are as follows. So generally, they um, are expressed four to five days after exposure, but this could vary. But generally in China, what they've seen is about five days. And the symptoms can start from mild. And if you've watched any of the uh, CNN broadcasts with Dr. Fauci, you may have heard that mild symptoms can be reported as mild pneumonia. So even when they use the word mild, mild can be associated with pneumonia, which most of us know is very serious. So mild symptoms were reported in 81% of people. Severe disease, so this means people have shortness of breath um, and some lung involvement, is reported to be 14%. Critical disease is reported to be respiratory failure, shock, or multi-organ dysfunction, and that has been reported in 5%. The overall case fatality rate um, was 2.3% and no deaths were reported in non-critical cases. So this was the general information that was coming out um, first about the disease and, and what we kind of know so far. And severe or fatal infections vary by location. If you've been watching the news or following this virus, you have heard about Italy. And in Italy, the case fatality at last um, reporting was 7.2% in contrast to South Korea, where it was only 0.9%. So drastic difference, and we have no idea why there are differences um, like that. The initial presentation usually begins with a fever and then a cough, most characteristically a dry, characteristically a dry cough, shortness of breath, and um, upon chest imaging, they're infiltrate. So 
if you do get to the point where you have to go to the hospital and they do CT scans, they've seen some changes in the lung. And um, so that's one of the initial presentations. And it moves very, very quickly. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS or ARDS, is a major complication in patients with severe disease and can manifest shortly after the onset of shortness of breath. Um, that I think that is what is probably scary for a lot of people because it can manifest really, really quickly. And it, there, right now, there isn't any rate to know how it will express in different people. Other complications have included arrhythmias, acute cardio, uh, cardiac injury, and shock. So these were more of the critical complications. Age. So right now, what we know is individuals of any age can acquire coronavirus, although adults of middle age and older are most commonly affected. Originally, when we started hearing about the coronavirus, the first thing we heard was, you know, talk to the elderly, make sh elderly population and make sure that they are aware and to stay home and to be protected. But what we've seen in a matter of weeks is that everyone is affected. And it is, um, it is likely that the older age has a, a big part to do with it. It is associated with increased mortality, and 80% of deaths are in those of over the age of 65. But I think when we heard this information, unfortunately, what it did was give a false sense of security to younger um, individuals, thinking that if they're in their 20s, they can't be affected, which is why it was even more important to talk to that population and explain that that's not the case. And we have seen deaths in the younger population as well. Symptomatic infection in children appears to be uncommon. And this is what I believe is the biggest blessing in this. And it's not to say that um, one life is more important than others. But for me personally, I know that I was, when I heard that, I just thought it was a blessing that children are least affected because you know, we kind of consider children to be our most innocent and um, our most precious commodity. And so I was really happy to hear about children being less affected. And when they are affected, it's usually mild. And there have been a few severe cases, but overall it's been mild. And that's, that's been the greatest blessing. Um, one theory in children that is currently being researched is a uh, possibility a possible connection with melatonin and children having higher levels of melatonin. The virus uh, interacts with that. So there's some studies going on right now about what that relationship is and why children are um, protected in that way. But they can also be asymptomatic carriers, which is something to be aware of. Even in patients overall who appear asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms at all, CT scans showed imaging abnormalities. So it should not be assumed that no damage is being done. So there's many people who could be walking around right now, and they're not showing any symptoms, but they may falsely believe that nothing is happening in their body, which is not true. Again, this is why we're stressing this stay home if you can, if you get nothing out of this conversation today. Please, please get that part. And Again, I know it's a luxury to stay home, but some people can order in. Some people can get groceries delivered. Some people can do curbside pickups. These are all options for many, many people. And for those of us who cannot do that, like the people on the front lines, the people who are serving in restaurants, the people who are cleaning, the people who are supporting healthcare workers, it's not possible for them. So let's just try to decrease the burden on the hospitals because we're seeing that the hospitals cannot withstand all these new cases. They're already, if you haven't already seen, the hospitals are already spent. They're, they're overworked and we can't add to that burden. The virus is, has also been seen in GI tract, as I mentioned before. Um, it can be in the stool before it even hits the respiratory tract. And it stays in the stool over a longer period of time. And um, as I mentioned before, that may be helpful as we move forward in trying to figure out how certain people are immune and, and what that looks like. A newer um, 
manifestation that has come out is that there are patients presenting with digestive symptoms, and digestive symptoms are associated with poorer outcomes. 34% had worse outcomes, so this is really important. Um, most of us are thinking about respiratory symptoms, but digestive symptoms have been a common occurrence and something to definitely take heed. And as I mentioned before, um, I talked about the scarring in the lungs. So even patients who do well in recovery, imaging shows that there can be some scarring after the event. What are some of the risk factors for severe illness? Some of you may have heard of some of these uh, risk factors, but let's talk about them a little bit. As I mentioned before, chronic disease is very, very prevalent in the United States. And many people, including yourself or people you know, may be suffering from the following diseases. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease. Again, this is not to alarm you. This is to let you know how this virus moves and the potential targets of this virus and people who are considered more vulnerable. Considering the large rates of chronic disease in this country, as I mentioned, this is, this is alarming. In, the, in some of the news we've heard lately about ACE inhibitor drugs, and this has caused people to be nervous and a little afraid and wondering, you know, what can they do? So one of the things I wanted to mention is that the current recommendation is not to discontinue ACE inhibitor drugs or um, ARB drugs. So if you are on any of these medications for hypertension, it is not recommended that you get off of these drugs. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because there have been some studies coming out of China that show that potentially people on these types of drugs, especially ACE inhibitors, um, it, there could be issues with that because the virus actually uses the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, and that's ACE2 for short, for cell entry. Also, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system inhibitor, so that's the ARB drug, um, can increase ACE2 levels. So this is where this came out of. Um, some of the Chinese researchers showed that there was some concern that they noticed, especially with patients who had hypertension. But again, it's not clear. The most recent paper coming out of JAMA uh, states that, in addition, there is concern that the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs will increase expression of the ACE2 and increase patient susceptibility to viral host cell entry and propagation. The virus may attach more readily um, and there may be more viral load, viral load but at a, as of this point, no one can say. So please, please, please do not discontinue your drugs, especially don't make any changes to your drugs before um, speaking to your doctor and um, potentially removing yourself off of drugs if you have hypertension, which is a risk factor, could make things more dangerous. So right now, we don't have enough information. Please, please do not make any changes. And this information comes from a study by Patel et al. and researching the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors in the ARB drug. So if you want more information about that, you can definitely check that out. Another population that's worth mentioning is um, those on immunosuppressive drugs. So as of right now, what um, the World Health Organization, the CDC, and different medical authorities are recommending is that it is a case-by-case -case basis. So there shouldn't be, again, any kind of discontinuance by certain drugs without more information. Another population that I am especially, especially interested in is pregnant women. I personally work with a lot of pregnant patients and um, deal with a population who's interested in fertility. And so I hadn't heard much about what was going on and what the recommendations were for pregnant women. And honestly, there aren't much um, because there's still not enough information about how it affects pregnant women. So far, there's a review of 38 pregnant women with COVID-19, 
and there were no cases of intrauterine transmission and no maternal deaths were documented. So as of this point, um, they're not seeing that transmission is happening from mother to baby and no maternal death as a result. The United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, we know this as the CDC, has advised hospitals to consider temporarily separating And this means putting the mother and the baby in separate rooms if the mother is suspected to have COVID-19. And um, this is until the mother's transmission-based precautions are discontinued. So um, I saw this research earlier this week, and um, many people were very upset by this recommendation, which is understandable. But as of this point, we don't know enough about how this will affect the baby um, or the mother for that matter. And it is unknown whether the virus can be transmitted through breast milk. So that's what we know so far. We're not really sure, but um, for those pregnant women out there who are listening to this, um, pregnancy is already such a fragile state. And I would hate for pregnant, I I mean, I know it's obvious that people are being affected by this, um, but I really hope that just hearing about that case might you know, keep people a little calmer. Um, Please, please, please practice the same recommendations for everyone else um, as pregnancy is a very vulnerable period. Prevention strategies. So by now, I mean, I think everyone knows what the CDC is, um, which I think is is a blessing. Um, My bias is that um, I love public health. I've worked in public health for so long. Um, and I remember when I was in um, studying for my master's in public health, I I just couldn't wait to possibly work for the CDC um, because I felt that the CDC was, you know, in public health in general, had this goal of promoting, preventing disease and protecting the public. And <clears throat> that's what it should be. And um, I, you know, I am concerned about, you know, where we are with public health right now. And I'm really hoping that out of this situation, we get stronger and, you know, we'll learn so much more about this disease and how to prevent it and how to protect people and move forward. This is my hope um, as a positive thing, that we'll move forward and be able to better contain these types of diseases in the future. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people are even aware of what public health is and what it does, because I remember years ago, no one know, knew what public health even really meant. So um, I'm happy people are following these recommendations. So what is the recommendation that we all have heard at this point? Wash your hands. I have to tell you, I'm the most excited about this recommendation because I am um, a fanatic about people washing their hands, so much so that it can be annoying to other people. But for anyone who's worked in healthcare, you know that washing your hands is extremely important. You know about how dry your hands can get. You know about wearing gloves. And as a result, this is one of the most important things that you can do. Um, it's interesting to me to see how many people are, you know, talking about this and the fact that many people don't know how to properly wash their hands. So it, it sounds so simple, but it's extremely important. So. When you're washing your hands, um, it's important that you wash your hands for 20 seconds. And one recommendation that I saw that might be helpful is um, washing your hands every two hours. So don't assume that because you're home or you've been sitting in one place that it's not important to keep washing your hands. You never know what you could be touching. Um, We've seen that many people are, you know, touching their faces, not even realizing that they're touching the faces. We touch our faces so much. We scratch our face. We touch our hair. And um, not a, we don't even realize how often we do that. So just keep washing your hands when in doubt. Keep wiping down surfaces. You have nothing to lose by doing that. Um, diligent hand washing, particularly after touching surfaces in public, is extremely important. In the beginning of all of this, I'd say about two weeks ago, um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the lack of hand sanitizer and people just went crazy buying hand sanitizer everywhere and it was sold out and there was this one story online about this 
man who purchased so much hand sanitizer and 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 was actually hoarding it and selling it uh upselling it for a profit um and you know in these types of situations it's honestly very disheartening to see that people will take advantage of other people um it's really important that we have these supplies it's extremely important that healthcare workers have these supplies so please 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 if you are listening and you're one of these people um please just donate whatever you have if you have gloves masks um hand sanitizer anything that might be helpful for a healthcare worker right now is extremely important there are major shortages right now so please 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 if you have any of these resources share them so going back to the hand sanitizer it's important um that it contains at least 60% alcohol and you're only using the hand sanitizer if your hands are not visibly dirty so hand sanitizer can never replace washing your hands so there's some people out there who have some confusion about hand sanitizer it is not a replacement it's just effective um to hold you over until you can wash your hands so take advantage of that keep it in your bag um keep it in the car make sure that you're you're using that whenever you can't get access to water and soap as i mentioned before avoid touching your face in particular your eyes nose and mouth so for the average person a mask um you know may not do anything as far as the virus what we've seen is regular masks don't provide protection because the droplets and the virus is so tiny that it can penetrate through an a regular mask so unfortunately that's not what you're using the mask for wearing a mask or covering your face is actually to prevent yourself from touching your face and introducing the virus that could be on your hands into your nostrils into your eyes rubbing your face touching your hair that's the purpose of wearing a mask so i strongly encourage that it may seem overly dramatic <laughs> at this point but i think it's only overly dramatic because we haven't even reached you know the peak of of infection in the united states so um unfortunately this is one of the ways to protect ourselves as i mentioned before it the virus is spread through respiratory droplets so it's extremely important to have good respiratory hygiene that means covering your cough or sneezing into your elbow whatever it is you need to do please do not sneeze on other people or cough on other people even if you you know are you don't have the virus or you appear asymptomatic um you know at this point that's just dangerous and i've seen online fights breaking out because of people not having respiratory hygiene so outside of the danger that this can pose please 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 do not do this and potentially get into arguments and fights over something as simple as respiratory hygiene. Another recommendation is cleaning and disinfecting objects and surfaces that are frequently touched. The CDC has actually issued a guidance on disinfection in the home. If you go to their website, they have a list of EPA registered products that can be found. So go to the CDC website and you'll be able to see what products are have been seen to um actually break down the virus and remove it. So a lot of these products may contain bleach um and other um disinfectants that we're aware of. This is why it's important to just keep cleaning, cleaning, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces. Also, I took a look at this um guidance and some of the products take up to 10 minutes to potentially get rid of the virus. So keep that in mind if you're cleaning um that doesn't mean the surface is ready. so to speak um when you're cleaning allow at least 10 minutes for most of the products that are approved when touching doorknobs use gloves or disinfectant wipes i can't tell you how important this is um when i first heard about this virus um in my own practice i was constantly trying to wipe down things and we don't realize how many times people pass through a certain area and when they're touching things and you know when you're even doing it yourself like when you're touching knobs you forget where you've been and what you've touched and when you've gone to the bathroom and when you've gone into the kitchen so if you are in a shared space with someone else make sure you're constantly wiping down doorknobs 
the entrance to your home, a lot of people forget that. Wiping down your keys, wiping down your car steering wheel. Um, you know, just, you know, this this virus, um, you know, I, I would say that people who are already a little um, OCD <laughs> have an advantage as far as cleaning. But I think we all can learn to um, adopt some better cleaning practices. Make sure to also wipe down light fixtures and cabinets, uh, the little knobs on the cabinets, because these are areas that are also missed. One of the other major things we've heard about over the past few days is avoiding crowds. And as I mentioned before, this is one of the more difficult parts of um, certain areas in our country where, unfortunately, it's not as easy to, to avoid crowds. Um, and so, unfortunately, they are at a disadvantage. Um, there's also, um, I wanted to mention just um, also the PPEs. And for people who aren't familiar with that terminology and, and what that is, so this is a protective equipment um, for healthcare workers. And it is re recommended that the average person does not wear any of these PPP, PPE items that are reserved for healthcare workers. These masks should be used for, in general, masks are meant to protect the person. So if I'm wearing a mask, it's meant to protect whatever droplets I may transmit to someone else. Um, so I think in the beginning, people were thinking that, oh, if I wear a mask, I won't get infected. And as I mentioned before, that's not the purpose of wearing something like that. Um, for us right now, um, if you are not a healthcare worker, it's mainly just to to um, protect yourself from yourself. So um, these face masks are crucial right now for healthcare workers. Um, they are the ones who should be getting these masks. So, and unfortunately, as we've heard in the news, there aren't enough to go around. So please do not hoard these materials right now. Um, there's so many initiatives going on for the creation of masks. Different companies have changed their policies for creating other products, and they're trying to create masks. There's 3D um, imaging being used to create more masks for healthcare workers. And it should be known that these N95 masks, which are the ones that are seen to be most effective, there's not enough of them. And they should be changed um, in a certain amount of time in between um, each patient. So right now, our healthcare workers who are on the front line are using a mask potentially for days. So they are very, um, you know, they, they just don't have enough. And it's really unfortunate. And I'm, I've been really happy to see that there are companies who are diverting their resources to creating more masks for healthcare workers because they really, really, really need it. Um, so again, that that is the whole mask debacle <laughs> that's been going on. And also another thing is um, going back to the hygiene, um, be sure that if you're using a tissue um, and that you're throwing it away properly, I've seen cases where people have use tissues and leave them on counters and countertops and things like that. So please just be mindful of, um, you know, how you're using, how you're cleaning and um, using your tissues. Um, I also wanted to mention that many people are making homemade masks. If you look online, you can um, create masks for yourself. There's uh, different types of strategies to create masks. Um, just to make sure that you're not touching your face in public. All right, so let's talk about testing criteria. And the following information comes from the World Health Organization. According to the World Health Organization, suspected cases should be screened for the virus with nucleic acid amplification tests. This is known as NAT, so N-A-A-T such as RT-PCR. So this is the um, test that is currently being used. Um, and I will, as we speak, I will say NAT for short. Patients should be tested also for other respiratory pathogens. So something we're not thinking about right now as COVID is in the forefront of our mind is that there can be co-infections. 
unfortunately, those co-infections make people more vulnerable to more aggressive, um, more aggressive cases. So, unfortunately, if you have more than one infection, you can be more at risk. And this is unfortunate, but what is being done is that patients are being tested for more than one. So um, that's important. Initially, kits were shipped out to many states, but they weren't dispersed properly according to population size. So if you think of a state like New York in comparison to a much smaller state, you can't really compare the amount of people in one versus the other. So the original issue was the lack of kits that we had in the country, which um, if you've been watching the news and you've seen that the numbers have spiked so quickly, it's because in originally we didn't have enough kids. We still don't have enough kids. Here in Connecticut, some urgent care uh, practices have started drive-through kit testing. And I also want to mention how this is another example of people who are putting their lives on the line because even doing the kits, people aren't aware that when you're doing this particular testing, you are being put at risk because you, it's very difficult to test someone at six feet. At the beginning in March, there were only 70 cases that had been reported in the U.S. Um, so you can see by now, uh, like I mentioned earlier in the show, that we're at 100, um, 100,000 cases. So from 70 in the beginning of March to where we are now, um, nearing the end of the month, the original test was problematic. And it only tested the N1 and N3 captive proteins. And now what's amazing is that there was an emergency use authorization that allowed CLIA certified labs, so these are the best labs in the country, to develop their own assays to develop a novel spike protein envelope target um, N1 and N3. So, sorry, I misspoke. So the original test was only testing one. And now the N1 and N3 is the technology that makes it easier to catch the actual virus. So the targets, when you can get targets in three or four positions, this allows for a better test. So the tests are better now, which is great, and more and more kits are being made. The viral genes targeted so far include N, E, S, and RDRP genes. So these are the genes that they're looking for. Probably too much information <laughs> for most of the audience, but for those of you who are interested in that, those are the genes that have been um, uncovered so far. And Dr. David Bra Brady, um, he's the one who was given some of this information earlier this week. He stressed the importance of needing a good sample. And currently, a uh, gold standard is the nasal pharyngeal swab. What people don't realize about this swab is that it is very, very, very uncomfortable. This is not something that you can do by yourself. This is something that only a qualified health practitioner should be using, and you have to go very, very deep. So if you think of the nasal pharyngeal area, this is all going all the way back to your throat. So this is not like a, a quick swab that people may be familiar with. Um, regular nasal swabs in the rapid test, unfortunately, produce a lot of false negatives. So this is why it's important to use the NAT test. And as of right now, the World Health Organization says that a positive test is has two, um, one of two requirements. So you're positive, you're positive on a NAT test on at least two targets on the COVID-19 virus genome or one positive NAT on the beta coronavirus and the COVID-19 virus, either that's partial or whole genome, so one of those two. And false negatives are also possible due to poor collection quality or if the person is tested late in the infection. So let's talk about a little bit after the infection. So after the infection, um, it's already been seen that there's scar tissue and some lung damage. There's out of China, um, there's new data showing, quote, mounting evidence substantiates the presence of cardiac injury in patients with COVID-19. The association between COVID-19 associated cardiac injury and risk of mortality remains unclear, end quote. 
a specimen to be collected at this point, we know it should be respiratory material and, as I mentioned before, nasal pharyngeal or oral pharyngeal swab in ambulatory patients. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, treatment now. So, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to be talking about any unsubstantiated treatments. Um, I'm just going to mention what people are considering right now. Um, they're obviously antiviral. There is a combination um, that's currently used, being used in New York, and it involves, um, in some of the hospitals, it involves IV vitamin C. So that's one, and that's been the most popular one, um, I think, so far, along with hydrochloroquinone. Um, so with the IV vitamin C, um, there's even been stories of people trying to make their own vitamin C at home, which is extremely dangerous. Please, please, please do not attempt this. Um, but they have found um, in, in one of the articles, they said that one of the doctors has seen great results with including the IV vitamin C. So this is done under very hygienic um, means and very carefully done. There's a new drug called remdesivir, which is also being looked at for treatment. And the most controversial one um, that everyone's been talking about is hydrochloroquine. Um, and that is a drug that most people are familiar with for malaria. And it's been seen to have some antiviral activity. Currently, there are some vaccine candidates. Germany, in particular, is, is one of the countries that is working on a vaccine. Um, there's also um, some other countries that are looking into a vaccine, including the United States. So that's a, a possible um, that's a possible connection right there. I mean, from what I've heard, it's probably going to take about 18 months to create a vaccine. And so what do we do in the meantime? You know, in the meantime, we do things like protecting ourselves, you know, avoiding outside exposure um, and taking that really seriously. On top of that, the same healthy activities that you would take if you had any other illness, you know, none of that goes out the window. It's simple things as far as just eating healthy food. It's not the time to really eat a lot of sugar or high fat food. And um, I know initially most people may find some comfort in some of those foods, but now's not the time to, to binge eat. And <laughs> although it may seem comforting, and at first, you know, obviously all of us are trying to just figure out how to manage through this and all the emotions through this. So, you know, this is no indictment or judgment, but long term, that's not the best way to, you know, manage through this. Um, there's this meme that I've seen online about the healthy food being in abundance in the stores and all the packaged foods being gone. So let's just try to increase our healthy fruits and vegetables at this time. And if there's any fear that you have about eating fruits and vegetables because of hands touching it on, on my website, I, um, I'm going to be posting some resources I also have reposted a video on my um, Facebook page um, with that Dr. Jennifer Pierre. And on that page, I actually have a video that was posted by a physician. It's a wonderful video where he talks about um, ways to wash your produce when you get home. It's an incredible video and in how he goes about doing it. For some people, they may feel it's excessive. For me, it's not. I think he did a great job showing how to properly wash the produce, the other thing that he did was he wanted um, to show you how, if you're buying takeout food, how to properly remove it from the bags and um, prepare it so that you can eat it. So it's a wonderful video. Please check it out. Again, it's on my Facebook page, Dr. Jennifer Pierre. And on my Instagram, I've also been posting some helpful tools. One of them has last week I did a live meditation because I'm very aware that people are suffering through this. They're struggling. Anxiety is on through the roof. A lot of my patients have reported increased anxiety and how to manage that. So um, on my Instagram page, it's at DRJ Pierre. Um, I posted about a meditation and I'll be posting more resources. Um, and this is not just to promote myself. This is because I'm trying to get out information that I think is helpful 
information that may provide some source of comfort to people. It's a very difficult time, and some people may be doing well right now, and a month from now they won't be. So it's important that, you know, whatever strategies we have to get through this that we employ. And to end off, that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about some ideas that we can use during quarantine. I've heard a lot of people complaining, how long is this going to go on? You know, this is crazy. People are losing jobs, and I'm not being insensitive to anyone who's lost their job. I know many people already who are laid off, and my heart breaks for them. We have to consider how not staying home is affecting people, and it may seem like, you know, our whole economy and everything is falling apart. And, you know, in a certain extent, it is. Um, stock market is crashing, but the reality is, to me, the value of a life, is it, it always supersedes everything to me. Um, and so I'm doing my part in, in any way that you can. Just do whatever part you need to, to do or take to protect yourself and other people so that this pandemic isn't worse than it already is. These are some ideas that I thought about that I wanted to share. Um, pray. This is my personal, um, one of my tools, one of my most important tools. It doesn't matter what religious, you know, affiliation you have. It's really not about religion here. It's about using whatever makes you feel comfortable and safe. And for me, prayer is a huge part of this. Meditation, I mentioned already before that I did a live meditation on Facebook um, because meditation is a huge part of my life. If you don't know, um, I was a yoga instructor for many years, and um, I find that turning inside at this particular point is extremely important. So whatever it is, it doesn't have to be complicated. I teach patients all the time breathing exercises just to stabilize your breath, and when we're stressed, we hold our breath. So just doing meditation can be helpful. Exercise. Right now, there's so many free online workouts. My own gym has online workouts um, on Facebook and Instagram, so you can easily find workouts including high-intensity interval training, also known as HIIT, yoga, Zumba. There's lots of free resources out there. Le Mills also has a great um, free workout going on right now. Learn a new skill like sewing, crocheting, quilting. Something that you can do at home. They're at home. There are literally videos online that can teach you how to do these things. So when I hear people mentioning that they're bored, it might be beneficial to learn something new. Starting a new business. I know that this seems counterintuitive right now as we watch our economy falling apart, but I guarantee you that you know we're going to get past this at some point. So start thinking about what you would want to create. And also thinking about an online business that you can start, as we can see in this climate of using Zoom in particular and go to webinar and all these things. Think about a business that you could do online using your website, using Shopify. Um, lots of great resources for businesses, old or new, right now in Connecticut and many other states. They are offering um, so many disaster relief efforts. So make sure you look into that. Also, um, another idea um, for those of you like myself who have student loans, make sure that you're discussing um, student loan options with your, uh, whether it's Fed Loan or whatever company that you currently have loans with. Find out your options so that you can stay on top of that. I think right now they're automatically doing certain forbearance efforts, but just find out the information so you're on top of things. There's also a lot of um, Right now, from different companies, they are, you know, canceling payments and, and different things like that. So instead of being very stressed about what's going on, call your companies to find out what's actually happening. This is a great time to reorganize your life and get rid of item, items that don't serve you currently. So, you know, declutter if you can. Read or listen to a new audiobook. Take an online course just to enrich your mind. Um, go back to well, there's so many courses that are for free online, so you can plan. As we can see, healthcare is extremely important, so that may be a great way, a great direction to go in. And um, play outside with your family. Spend time with family at this particular point. Um, that's the biggest blessing out of this for me is spending time with family. 
and there's a lot of free entertainment online. So take advantage of museum collections or Broadway plays. And finally, if you haven't participated in a virtual dance party um, that was sponsored this week by Be Nice, um, feel free to do things like that and coffee break and happy hour. So that's my time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with me today. Um, I hope that this information is helpful to you. Again, my name is Dr. Jennifer Pierre, and you can reach out to me at drjpierre.com. Again, that's drjpierre.com for resources. And please be sure to check 